story. And uh, it's kind of a, a downer of a story, but I think it's illustrative of the situation that we're in. Uh, and the story is about a company called Komodo. Komodo is a certificate authority. Uh, according to Netcraft, uh, they certify somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of the certificates on the internet. They're the second largest certificate authority in the world. And in March of this year, uh, they got hacked. The attacker was able to make off with uh, a number of certificates uh, for most of the popular webmail providers and places like Skype, uh, uh, Mozilla's add-ons, uh, website, uh, things like that. And immediately after the attack, the uh, CEO and founder of Komodo uh, issued a statement. And he said, this attack was extremely sophisticated and critically executed. It was a very well-orchestrated well clinical attack, and the attacker knew exactly what they needed to do and how fast they had to operate. He went on to add that all of the IP addresses involved in the attack were from Iran. So he's implying that there's this cyber undertone to what's happened. But he doesn't leave it at innuendo. He actually spells it out. He says, all of the above leads us to one conclusion only, that this was likely to be a state-driven attack. So he's painting a pretty complete picture for us. Um, this isn't just a hack. Uh, this is war. And who can blame Komodo for uh, you know, not being able to withstand the full assault of an invasion from uh, a foreign country? And so ironically, it was these statements that really catapulted the story out of the trade press and into the mainstream media. Um, and a number of reporters uh, contacted me in the aftermath of all of this, and they all had similar questions. What does this mean? And I would say, well, it means that you know, this attacker can now intercept secure communication for these websites. Uh, and then they'd say, no, no, well, you know, like, how would they use them? How would they use these certificates? Uh, and I would say, well, you know, these are commercial solutions from these uh, kind of scary companies like Blue Code or whatever, you know, that provide intercept services. Um, and then I remember I was talking to one reporter, and, and she was like, no, no, what's the easiest way? What is the most simple way that an attacker could do this without having to buy anything or just, you know, deploy something very simply? And I thought about it, and I said, well, you know, they could just use SSL sniff which is a tool that I wrote for uh, performing man-in-the-middle attacks on SSL connections. Now, Komodo did something kind of unusual here, which is that they published the IP address of the attacker um, on their website as part of this incident report. And I think the reason that they did this is they were kind of you know, trying to underscore like Iran, Iran, Iran. It was Iran. Uh, because the IP address happens to be from an IP block registered to Iran. Um, and so, you know, I was thinking about this, uh, you know, conversation I had with this reporter about SSL sniff, and, you know, this IP address is on this, this website, and I thought, well, I wonder. And so I went and I looked at my web logs uh, from my web server, and sure enough, the morning after the attack on Komodo, the same IP address of the attacker downloaded SSL sniff from my website. <laughs> So there are some kind of interesting things here uh, that we can learn from the logs. And one of them, uh, the attacker runs Windows. Second, their browser is localized to US English. Hmm. But the most interesting thing was the refer. I you know, went back through my web logs and found the, the moment when they initially contacted my website so that I could see what they got linked from, what, web, was, what website they were browsing beforehand. And it was a Hack 5 video on doing man-in-the-middle attacks with SSL strip, which is another <laughs> tool that I wrote. I, for those of you who might not be familiar with Hack5, it's sort of like an introduction to simple hacking techniques, simple video tutorials. So just to break it down for you, on one hand, we have the CEO of Komodo saying this is a clinical attack. And on the other hand, we have an attacker who is literally following video tutorials on the internet for introductory hacking material. I haven't watched this video yet. Maybe it was really good. And it turned anybody that watches it into a clinical attacker who could take down certificate authorities worldwide. Could be that good. Uh, and then throughout the day, there were a number of other really uh, embarrassing refers. The same attacker kept revisiting my website, and I could see their Google search terms that led them there again, you know? And it would be things like SSL protocol, man in the middle, how to IP tables pre-routing. Apparently, the attacker was having some trouble with their IP table setup. 
Uh, so I'm kind of chuckling to myself about all of this, you know, it's kind of a humorous situation. Uh, and then the attacker publicly posted a communique uh, to Pastebin. And it could not have been more embarrassing for, for anybody involved, really. Uh, he alternates between making these really grandiose statements about you know, these impossible claims, like he can decrypt RSA, uh, and then simultaneously making these uh, very proud statements about trivial things, like you know, he can create his own SOAP APIs and export functions from DLLs. Um, uh, so it's just, you know, it just couldn't have been more embarrassing for him, for Komodo, for, you know, it's just all around ridiculous. And then, well, it's worse, he just wouldn't shut up. He just kept posting communiques, uh, each more embarrassing than the last. Uh, I think he posted six in total. And then he started doing interviews with the press where he's also making these ridiculous statements, right? So this, it just couldn't have been worse uh, for, for Komodo, really. Uh, and so the CEO responded by issuing another statement where he said, if there were a secure and trusted DNS, this issue would be a moot point. We need a secure and trusted DNS, exclamation point. So he has just very enthusiastically declared that he does not understand the business that he's in. <laughs> on one hand, he, he seems to suggest that DNS tampering is the only way to perform a man in the middle attack, which is not true. And on the other hand, I don't know if he understands that the reason that we have SSL certificates is because it's possible to intercept communication. That his business is predicated on that. That if it were not possible to perform a man in the middle attack, we would not need the certificates that he's selling us. <laughs> this is the guy that's securing a quarter of the internet. Um, later that month, they were hacked twice more. And then a month later, they were hacked again. <laughs> so normally, I wouldn't spend this much time kind of ragging on a company like Komodo. But I think it's interesting to talk about this uh, because you know, there's this question, right, which is um, what happened to Komodo you know, in the aftermath of all this? Couldn't have been more embarrassing, right? I mean, couldn't have been worse. What happened to them? Nothing. Nothing happened to Komodo. They didn't lose business, they didn't lose customers, they didn't get sued, nothing. In fact, the only thing that happened to Komodo is that this year at RSA, the CEO was named Entrepreneur of the Year. <laughs> and so I think that this, this is the problem. This, this is the situation that we're in. And uh, we need to look at this moving forward. So to back up a little bit, let's just look at the high level. Any secure protocol needs to provide three things. Secrecy, integrity, and authenticity. You've got to have all three. If one of these breaks, the whole protocol breaks. But you know, what's important to remember is that SSL was designed in the early 90s. Uh, and that was a different time. Uh, there wasn't a lot of information available on how to design a secure protocol at the time. Uh, books like Applied Cryptography hadn't yet been published. Um, you know, not that much was being done in academia. I mean, if you wanted to use RSA, the algorithm, you had to license the patent from RSA, the company. It was still patented. Um, you had to pay money just to use RSA uh, in your application. Things like e-commerce didn't exist yet. The whole notion of transmitting your credit card number uh, over the internet was non-existent. Um, there weren't even really web applications at the time. The concept of transmitting some uh, secure credentials of the internet was also a foreign concept, you know? At the same time, the internet was tiny. According to ISC, there were less than five million hosts on the entire internet at the time that SSL was designed. Compare that to today, where there's, we're about to run out of publicly facing IP addresses at four billion. So at the time that SSL was designed, there were probably less than 10 secure sites that you could imagine. You know, less than 10 sites that you could think of, you would think, well, yeah, I want this to be secure. For some reason, I would want my communication with this site to be encrypted. Compare that to today, where there's over 2 million certificates on the internet, and ideally, we'd like all sites to be secure. At the same time, you know, SSL was designed at Netscape in the early 90s, uh, during a period of time where there's a lot of intense pressure um, on the employees. Uh, you know, this is the same place where a, a series of 4 a.m. decisions gave us JavaScript <laughs> at the same time. And we're, and we're still paying for that today. So when you look back at SSL, it's actually, they did a remarkable job, you know, that it's managed to endure this long. Uh, you know, when it comes to secrecy and integrity, 
they did pretty well. There have been some problems. There's still some problems. Um, but the real issue uh, has always been authenticity. And uh, it's always caused a little bit of friction. And now it's starting to cause really severe problems that I think are only going to continue and get worse. Um, now, the reason authenticity is important is to pre prevent man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, so normally, you'd like to establish a secure connection to, from some client to some server. Um, and that's easy enough. But there's always the possibility that your connection was intercepted by a third party. And you've just established a secure connection to some the wrong person, who then establishes a secure person with the right connection with the right person, and then just shuttles data back and forth. And no one is the wiser, but the attacker is able to decrypt all of the traffic in, in, in between. Now, the thing to remember is that when SSL was designed, this kind of attack, the man in the middle attack, was entirely theoretical. The network tools didn't exist. Uh, you know, the, there, you know, no one was performing these attacks. It was the kind of thing that was purely theoretical. Well, you could theoretically, you know, do this thing where you intercept the connection and thing, you know. Uh, and so the solution that they came up with uh, was certificates and certificate authorities. The idea is that every site will generate a certificate that it will present to the client, and the client will know that this is uh, authentic because it is signed by some authority that we've decided to trust for some reason. Now, you know, in kind of preparing for this talk, I, uh, I have this hypothesis, right, that, um, that we've basically outgrown this, the circumstances in which SSL was originally designed. Uh, and so I thought, well, I wonder if that's true. I wonder you know, what they were thinking when they were designing this. And so I thought, well, I should ask the people that designed it. Uh, so, and then I thought, well, who designed SSL? And I kind of looked, and it was kind of you know, difficult to figure out what's going on. And eventually, I figured out that SSL was actually designed by a guy at Netscape whose name was Kip Hickman. And uh, the last thing that Kip Hickman posted to the internet was in 1995. So it was sort of off the map. Uh, and so I talked to a bunch of people at Mozilla who were, back, who were there back in the Netscape days. And eventually, I, I managed to track him down. Um, and uh, I basically cold called him. You know, or I, you know, I, you know, I called him on the phone. I said, is this Kip Hickman? Yeah. I was like, did you used to work at Netscape? And he's like, a long time ago. And I was like, did you design SSL? And he's like, who is this? <laughs> and, so uh, you know, I managed to ex you know, ex convince him that uh, you know, he should continue talking with me. And, uh, but yeah, and then you know, once I started talking to him, it was great. Uh, he was, he's an amazing guy. And he's like, yeah, SSL. I haven't thought about that in a long time. He's like, all right, yeah, well, I, you know, I don't know if you know. There's like some problems you know, with this authenticity thing. He's like, oh, authenticity. Yeah, I was like, oh, that thing, man. He's like, I tell you, we just threw that in at the end. He's like, yeah, you know, I, you know, someone told us about this thing, the man in the middle attack, whatever. You know, really, SSL was designed to prevent passive attacks. And uh, you know, someone told us about it, so we threw this in. And he's like, basically, you know, the whole thing was just a bit of a hand wave. We didn't know if it was going to work. We didn't really know how it was going to work, you know. <laughs> and it's like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so I said, well, you know, this seems, we've been having some problems, you know, some of it is associated with like scaling, you know, scalability. How did you see the scaling over time? He said, scaling? He's like, you, you, he's like, you have to remember this was a different time. He says, you know, when, when we designed SSL, Yahoo was a web page with 30 links on it. That's what Yahoo was, you know. I was like, all right, I, I get the picture. So you know, and I think if you look at the history, uh, it kind of makes sense, right? You know, back in 1994, where the number of systems on the internet is approaching zero, um, you know, it makes sense. You have uh, some authority or some small group of authorities. There's probably less than 10 secure sites that you can imagine in the world. They look very carefully at those 10 sites. They sign the certificates. Everything will work fine. But over time, you know, we get to uh, almost a billion domains on the internet. Ideally, we'd like them all, all to be secure. And it sort of seems unrealistic that you know, one entity or even a group of entities can look very carefully at a billion different certificates and uh, you know, manage this problem effectively. And history has kind of borne this out. Um, Ivan Ristic put together a nice little threat matrix of all the things that could go wrong with SSL. And you know, up here, you have uh, some of the, the problems with uh, secrecy and integrity that have cropped up over time, still cause some small problems. Down here, you have things like user interaction. These are things like SSL strip, um, you know, still causing problems. But up here, with the authenticity piece, this is what has always caused real friction and is now causing real problems. And so I think the message here shouldn't, you know, from the Komodo attack, shouldn't have been that this was cyber war. 
But this is the kind of thing that's happening every day. Uh, you know, look at one of the domains the attacker was able to uh, get a certificate for, login.live.com. You should remember that in 2009, Mike Zussman got the same certificate just by asking for it. He didn't have to create his own SOAP APIs or export functions from DLLs or whatever, you know? Just asked. Uh, Eddie Nig got a certificate from Mozilla.com with no validation at all. No one asked him a single question. VeriSign issued a code signing certificate to Microsoft Corporation, for Microsoft Corporation, to unknown attackers who have still not been identified today. This kind of thing happens all the time. Recently, I needed to get an SSL certificate. I have a real hard time getting SSL certificates these days. I, so I thought, well, straight to the bottom of the barrel. So I went to this website, SSLinabox.com. They issue certificates. This is the kind of thing where you got to type in, you got to create an account in order to get a certificate. You know, so I go to create the account, I fill out my information. You know, I click create account, and it just logs me into someone else's account. <laughs> it's like I'm not even trying to hack anything. I just, it's like annoying. It's like I just want the certificate. You know, so all right, all right. I sign out. You know, like type in my thing again. Create account. Logs me into a different account. Every time I do it, I just get someone else's account. I'm thinking, well, I could just keep doing this until I find something interesting, but I actually just want a valid certificate for myself. Um, I didn't even email them. I mean, I, I don't think they, they care. This is the kind of thing that happens all the time. Uh, here's, this is a certificate authority who actually published the private key for their certificate in the publicly accessible directory of their web server. And you can kind of understand. No, I mean, you can't understand. but. You know, someone could make this mistake, right? But the really egregious thing is, it's still there. <laughs> it's been there since 2009. These are the people securing the internet. Uh, Starcom was recently hacked. A DigiNotar was recently hacked that made big news. It was the same guy, same, uh, same attacker in the Komodo instance. And, you know, honestly, if you don't even have to go through the trouble of hacking a CA, right? Uh, you could just buy a certificate. Yeah, there's uh, CAs that have these uh, programs like uh, GeoTrust, uh, where basically you give them like 50 grand, and they give you an intermediate CA certificate, which you can use to now create and sign any certificate that you want in the world. You have to promise not to do that, but that's it. And th this is part of the reason everyone's like, oh, it's Iran, it's the state-sponsored attack and all this thing. It's like, I, part of the reason I don't think that that's true is because Iran probably has 50 grand to just buy a a CA certificate, you know? They don't have to go through the trouble of hacking a CA or anything, right? I, I love the logo in the top right. I feel like it's so iconic. The key to the world, you know? They'll give it to you if you got enough. And what if this was state-sponsored? What if these attacks are state-sponsored? Well, the, the, thing to, the important thing to remember is that the only reason that Iran would have to hack a CA or buy a CA certificate uh, is because they don't have one of their own. And uh, most countries do, or many countries do. Uh, the EFF uh, has a nice project called the SSL Observatory, where they scan the internet uh, to create a map of all the organizations that are capable of signing certificates in the world. And uh, there's, a, I put together a map of um, the governments that possess certificates uh, and are capable of intercepting communication. So this is what the map looks like. The countries in red are capable of uh, intercepting secure communication on the internet today. They have CAs. I don't know if you can see, way out in the center of the Atlantic Ocean, there's a little speck, and that's Bermuda. Bermuda is capable of signing certificates. I actually got an email from these guys recently. They were like, yeah, yeah, I saw the talk, you know, like, that's us, we're Bermuda. I was like, cool, all right, kill it. Um, so the good news is that I feel like the, the, the general vibe here is sort of shifting. Uh, from the old vibe of this is a total ripoff to the new vibe of this is a total ripoff and mostly worthless. The, we're not actually getting anything for our money. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about replacing the authenticity piece of SSL with something else. Uh, but I think that if we're going to do that, we first need to very clearly understand the problem so that we don't just end up making the same mistakes all over again. So what is the problem? Well, uh, there's been a number of uh, you know, takes on this, right? Um, the EFF uh, put together this SSL observatory data where they have, um, they put together a graph of all of the organizations on the internet that are capable of signing certificates. 
It's a lot of organizations. Uh, and so, I, in fact, it's 650 different organizations. Uh, and so I think, you know, kind of a simplistic response to this has just been to say, there's too many CAs. That's the problem. There's too many certificate authorities. We just need fewer certificate authorities, you know? But I, I don't know if that resonates with me, you know? Remember when there was only one? And they could do and charge whatever they wanted? And if part of the problem is that it's a scaling issue, that we've gone from 20 secure sites to 2 million secure sites, and that you know, these organizations just haven't been able to keep up with that, if anything, it seems like we would want more, not less, not fewer. Another kind of simplistic response uh, has been to say that there's just a few bad apples. You know, that most of the CAs are pretty good, but then we have people like DigiNotar or whatever, and they're, you know, there's just a few bad apples, we just need to weed them out. But I think if you look closely here, there's really nobody that doesn't have dirt on their hands. I don't, there's really nobody that I feel like we can trust absolutely. Even VeriSign, when they were the only game in town, at the same time that they were selling certificates to secure our communication, they had a section of their business managing so-called lawful intercept services for governments. So the same organization that we were trusting to secure our communication had a section of their business that was about intercepting communication. So I, I think if you look closely, there's really nobody here that does not have dirt on their hands. Another thing that people suggest is that it's a scoping issue, that the problem is that everybody's in the same scope, uh, that all the CAs are in just one big scope, and in that if we could just separate the scopes, uh, that everything would be fine. You know, for instance, uh, the Department of Homeland Security and China are both uh, capable of signing certificates and they're in the same scope. And if we could just separate the scope so that you know, the DHS could only sign certificates for the United States and China could only sign certificates for the state of China, then everything would be fine. Uh, I feel like this is kind of a low bar. Uh, I think that there are plenty of people in China that might not trust the state of China to certify their communication, just as I feel like there are plenty of people in the United States, uh, and I'm probably one of them, that don't trust the Department of Homeland Security to secure my communication. So I think in trying to define the problem so that we can move forward, I think it's useful to look back at this question of what happened to Komodo. Well, nothing. Nothing happened to Komodo. But the question is why. You know, What could we have done? If I decide that I don't trust Komodo, and I don't, the very best thing I can do is remove Komodo from my trust database, remove them from my list of trusted authorities. The problem is that if I do that, somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of the internet disappears, just stops working, breaks completely, because those certificates are no longer considered valid. Now, I could take an ideological stance, just never visit those websites again. Uh, but in reality, there's, that's not a very appropriate response. And the, the, the interesting thing to remember here is that this is as true for browser vendors as it, as it is for you or me. You know, a browser vendor can't just remove Komodo from their trust database because they're going to be breaking a core to the internet for all of their users. And that's, that's a really hard decision to make. And the, the thing is, the browser vendors know it, and Komodo knows that they know it, and they're just sort of eyeing each other down, you know. Um, the truth is that somewhere along the line, we made a decision to trust Komodo, and now we're locked into trusting them forever. And I think that this is the essence of the problem. That I think we can reduce all of the problems that we have with authenticity and SSL today to a single missing property. And I call that property trust agility. Trust agility has two major components. Uh, the first is that a trust decision can be easily revised at any time. So there are plenty of people that say, oh, Moxie, you, know, you don't trust anybody. That's not true. There's a, any number of organizations that I could identify today for me that I would trust. But what seems insane to me is to think that I could identify an organization or a set of organizations that I would be willing to trust not just now, but forever, regardless of whether they continue to warrant my trust or not, regardless of uh, you know, whatever incentives that they have to continue uh, acting appropriately. The second component is that individual users can decide where to anchor their trust. And this is the same thing as saying individual clients or individual web browsers can decide where to anchor their trust. And if we look back at the scoping issue, you know, some people say, oh, well, the problem is VeriSign and Komodo are in the same scope. If we could just separate the scope, you know, if Facebook was signed by VeriSign and VeriSign did something particularly egregious, then Facebook could just choose to switch to Komodo 
and that would actually matter, unlike today when it doesn't matter, because VeriSign could continue signing certificates for Facebook. Um, but, you know, I think this is a stretch. Uh, if it was a struggle for us to get websites to deploy HTTPS to begin with, it seems like a stretch to think that they're going to continue to very actively be making decisions in our best interests. The other thing is that in this increasingly globalized world, it doesn't really make sense for a website to make a single trust decision for everybody. You know, people live in different places. They have different th threats. They have different trust metrics. They have you know, uh, different organizations that they might be uh, interested in putting their trust in. And the thing is, it's our data. It's our data that's at risk here. So it should be our trust decision. Now, this property that individual users can decide where to anchor their trust, or individual clients, or web browsers, is actually a very simple inversion of what exists today. Uh, you know, right now, there's three parties involved in any uh, trust relationship, right? Uh, there's the client, the server, and the authority. And the thing is, right now, the authority initiates this trust relationship by con or, I'm sorry, the server initiates this trust relationship by contacting an authority and saying, hey, will you certify me? The authority responds with a certificate, which is eventually relayed through the server back to the client. So what we're doing is talking about just inverting this, so that instead of the server initiating this trust relationship, it's the client that initiates the trust relationship by contacting an authority and saying, will you certify this website for me? Now, the reason that's so powerful is because it means it's the client that gets to decide who to talk to which means that the scoping issue isn't actually an issue. The, the Department of Homeland Security can sign certificates for Chinese websites, and it doesn't matter because users in China will just ignore that authority, not talk to it, and talk to the state of China. Or they might decide that they don't trust the state of China either and talk to an NGO or something else instead. Now, I think that these uh, two components of this property, trust, agility, are essential uh, for whatever we move forward with. Uh, in terms of replacing authenticity in SSL. Now, I want to take a, a few minutes to talk about DNSSEC, because there's been a lot of talk about using DNSSEC to, um, to leverage a, a replacement for authenticity lately. Uh, the basic idea is that you take your SSL certificate and you just shove it in your DNS record. Uh, it's actually a lot more complicated than that. There's, I think, 20 different RFCs involved, but um, that's the, the simple gist of it. Uh, that way, when a client does a DNS lookup, for the server that wants to contact, wants to you know, make an SSL connection to paypal.com. So it does a DNS lookup for paypal.com. And it gets back the IP address that it needs to connect with. And it also gets back the server's SSL certificate inside the DNS response. And uh, we, we know that we can trust this response because it's signed using DNSSEC. Now, when the client actually makes the connection to paypal.com, it gets a certificate. And it just compares it to what it saw on the DNS record. And if they're the same, then everything's good. Otherwise, everything's bad. Um, now, there's a really immediately visceral appeal. Uh, I, f I think people experience this visceral appeal to, to this kind of system when they first see it. Uh, and I think it's because people mentally associate DNS with the word distributed. And that sounds pretty good right now. In fact, it sounds like exactly what we want. After years of suffering under the centralized yoke of certificate authorities, uh, it would be a pleasure if we could just wipe them off the page and replace them with a distributed system instead. The problem is that when you start to look at it more carefully, it's the information in DNS that's distributed amongst the DNS zones across the internet. But the trust is actually highly centralized. And this is actually identical to the way that the CA system works today. The information, the actual SSL certificates, are distributed across the internet on the web servers of the various websites that you want to connect to. And the trust is extremely uh, centralized in the certificate authorities themselves. So you know, then you think, well, uh, OK, so it's not actually distributed in the way that we want. Uh, maybe there's you know, different people that we, we would be able to trust that are for some reason better than the people that we have to trust now. Uh, or maybe there's some trust agility in there somewhere. Um, so if we start to look at the trust requirements, there are actually three uh, classes of people that we have to trust um, absolutely under DNSSEC. And the first is the registrars. Um, now, registrars, you know, if you think CAs are sketchy, I think <laughs> registrars just take it up a notch. You know, they're, they're just a little, little sketchy. You know, I, personally, I think it should be laughable 
that the current first step in deploying DNSSEC is to create an account with GoDaddy. <laughs> I think that should be laughable. Um, the next class of people we have to trust are the TLDs. These are the companies that manage the TLDs. Uh, and uh, for .com and .net, uh, the company that manages uh, those zones is VeriSign. Same player, same game. Uh, we have to trust them with all our, all our secure communication again. Uh, for other TLDs, uh, for other GTLDs like a .org and .edu, um, you know, most people probably don't even know what organizations are responsible for managing these TLDs. Um, certainly, I don't think that they would be come to the top of your, your list of like, organizations that you would want to trust in the world. You know? Take a moment to research the, the companies that manage uh, these TLDs. Look at the people on the, the board of directors. Look at the people managing operations and ask yourself, are these the people that you want to trust with all of your secure communication? Then there's the CC TLDs. Does everybody uh, with hip domains like .io, .cc, and .ly trust the corresponding governments uh, behind these TLDs? Uh, what about TLDs like .ir and .cn? Should people that live uh, in these regions have to trust all of their local secure communication to these governments? Um, the EFF's SSL observatory data says that these are the countries in the world that are currently capable of intersecting secure communication um, without breaking a sweat uh, under the CA system. Uh, with DNSSEC, it would look like this. <laughs> and if the recent domain seizures are any indication of the future, um, these TLDs are, are probably suspect. Uh, and then the, the, the final class of uh, people that we need to trust uh, under DNSSEC is the root. And in, the, in this case, that's ICANN. Now, I don't have any particular beef with ICANN, um, but as far as I know, while they have uh, made a, a lot of efforts to, to be a sort of global, a global organization and solicit global involvement, as far as I know, legally, they're a California 501c3 nonprofit, which as far as I know, uh, means that they are subject to US laws. And uh, if any of the recent uh, legislation is any indication of the future, that could be a problem. Uh, you know, these laws like COICA, protect IP, or whatever. Uh, to me, the interesting thing here isn't whether these individual laws pass or not, although it's not looking good uh, these days, um, but that, that they're trying. And even if they don't succeed with these laws, maybe they will in the future. And I think that's something to be concerned about. Um, so the worst part here is that all of these organizations actually provide reduced trust agility. Uh, to the uh, existing CA system. Right now, as unrealistic as it might be, I could decide to remove VeriSign from my trust database. It would break a lot of shit, but I could at least do it, you know? Um, but there's nothing that I can do to change the fact that VeriSign controls the .com and .net TLD. There's no way to remove them from that trust relationship at all. Which means that if we sign up to trust these people now, we're signing up to trust them forever, regardless of whether they continue to warn our trust or not. There's no way to untrust them. And you know, the, a lot of these uh, organizations have already proven that uh, they should not warn our trust. So I want to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, solutions for the future that I'm a little bit more inspired by. Uh, one project uh, is called Perspectives. Uh, Perspectives was originally a paper that was published by Dan Winland, David Anderson, and Adrian Perig at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and it was a paper basically on using multipath probing for uh, authenticity. And the basic idea is to use network perspective. Uh, the premise is that you've got a client, you want to connect to a server, uh, you get back a certificate from the server. And now the big question, is the certificate valid or not? Well, what do you do? Um, what you do is you contact some other authority on the internet and you say, hey, what certificate do you see for this website? The authority makes just a normal SSL connection to the same website, gets a certificate back, and responds, uh, sends that certificate back to the client. Now on the client side, you compare the two certificates you saw, and if they're the same, you, know, you assume that uh, this, is, this is the valid certificate. Uh, we call these authorities notaries, and you don't have to talk to one notary, you can talk to any number of notaries. And they are distributed all across the internet uh, with different network paths to the same destination. Uh, you're essentially building a constellation of trust. Now, this idea of using network perspective is actually not new. It's actually how things work right now. Um, 
if you, in the CA system, if you're a site operator and you want to get a certificate for your website, you contact a certificate authority like VeriSign and you say, hey, I would like an SSL certificate for my website. Could you make one for me? And what do they do? What does VeriSign do? They send you an email. They send an email to paypal.com with a validation code in it. And if you can receive the validation code, uh, you communicate that back to the CA and they issue you a certificate. So they're already using network perspective. What we're doing is simply inverting that so that it's user initiated instead of server initiated or client initiated rather than server initiated. Uh, now, when the Perspectives paper was first published, it came along with an implementation. Uh, but the implementation was uh, somewhat limited. Uh, it was originally designed for self-signed certificates. Uh, and uh, so it had some problems. Uh, the first problem with Perspectives was completeness. Uh, that Perspectives, uh, the implementation, only worked for the initial connection that your web browser made to a web server. So it didn't work for any of the background content, any of the CSS, any of the JavaScript, any of that stuff. So it wasn't possible to eliminate CAs entirely. It was, you were only circumventing CAs for this first initial connection that you made. Uh, the second problem is privacy. Uh, if every time you connect to a web server, you get a certificate back, you contact some notary, and you say, hey, what do you see for this website? Now you're essentially leaking your entire browsing history to one or a set of third parties, which seems unfortunate. Uh, and the final problem was responsiveness. Uh, Perspectives has this problem of what's called notary lag, uh, where the way it works is when you get a certificate, you contact a notary and you say, hey, what certificate do you see for this website? Now, the notary is going to cache the certificate that it gets so that it doesn't have to continually make you know, a connection every time someone contacts it. And then it's up to the notary to continue polling the same website uh, in case the website certificate ever changes. Um, but the problem is that if you talk to the notary in between the poll interval after the certificate is changed, then you're going to get a certificate error. And so it's this kind of weird problem. So what I've done is I've taken um, these ideas and I've tried to extend them uh, into a system that I call Convergence. Uh, Convergence is a new protocol, a new client implementation, and a new server imp implementation. The first thing we, that we do with Convergence is address these challenges, completeness, privacy, and responsiveness. Um, the first thing we do is just eliminate notary lag. It's a simple solution. When you contact the notary, you send the certificate you saw as well. That way, if there's a cache mismatch on the notary side, it knows to reconnect to the client. Or I'm sorry, reconnect to the server, and so there's no more notary lag. The second thing that we did was address privacy. Uh, the first thing that we did there was implement local caching. So now, if you get a response back from a notary that says, yeah, this certificate's A-OK, -okay, or a set of notaries that say this certificate's A-OK, -okay, uh, you take that certificate and you put it in a local cache. Now, the next time you connect to the same website, you get a certificate back. The certificate hasn't changed. You compare it to what's in your local cache. If it's the same, you don't have to talk to anybody, which means that you only have to talk to notaries on the initial connection to a website or when a website certificate changes, which means that you only leak your connection history uh, on, in those two events. But that also just still doesn't seem great. You don't want to leak your connection history at all, ideally. Uh, so the next thing that we did was implement notary bouncing. Uh, now, the way that that works is you want to connect to some set of notaries. And communication with notaries is done using SSL, uh, using pre-shared certificates. Now, uh, you want to connect to a notary. So the first thing you do is select uh, one notary out of your list, and you uh, make it the bounce notary. Then you make a connection to that notary and basically set up a standard HTTP proxy to connect through the notary to the other ones. And you speak SSL directly to all of the other notaries. So the bounce notary knows who you are but doesn't know what you're asking about, because all that, all that communication is protected by SSL. The destination notaries know what you're asking about, but they don't know who you are, uh, because all of the communication is coming from the bounce notary. So basically, uh, two notaries would have to collude in order to reveal your browsing history, which I feel like is a much higher and acceptable bar. Now, uh, our initial conver convergence implementation is a Firefox add-on. Uh, and the way it works is you install it into Firefox, and it's a very simple install. Uh, as soon as it's installed, you get a button in the top right-hand corner uh, that's the little convergence icon. And if you click the button, you are off the CA system entirely. You don't have to trust CAs anymore. The way it works is then the entire user experience is identical. Uh, let's say you go to a website. Now, normally, uh, if you go to a website uh, and you look at the, um, the favicon, uh, when you mouse over the favicon, uh, you get a little tooltip saying uh, what authority validated uh, this communication. 
The only difference, everything looks the same, is that in convergence, we've taken the authority out of the, out of the picture, and everything is authenticated by convergence instead. The server-side implementation is designed to be extensible for the future. Convergence is not dependent on this network perspective strategy. Uh, instead, we have a REST API, and um, the default implementation is for uh, the notary to make uh, these network perspective uh, connections to the destination server. But really, the notary can do whatever it wants, and we have a few uh, notary backends that are options when you run a notary. Uh, one is DNSSEC. If you like DNSSEC for some reason, the notary can do DNSSEC. Uh, the other is CA signatures. If you're crazy and you want to keep using CA signatures, your notary can uh, validate certificates using CA signatures. Uh, you could do weird things like use a notary as a front end to the SSL observatory, that's the, ESF, the EFF project, uh, or as a front end to the Google certificate catalog. Uh, you could even have you know, a set of notaries configured in your client, each one doing a different thing. One's network perspective, another's DNSSEC, another's CA signatures, another's the SSL observatory. Uh, and now all of these things uh, have to validate correctly. Um, there's a uh, collective trust meter uh, on the client side that you can set anywhere from minority uh, all the way up to consensus. And the default is majority or consensus. Uh, so uh, the nice thing about that is, you know, in the CA system, you have 650 different organizations. If any one of them is bad, you're out of luck. Uh, a single, uh, single compromise is enough to kill you. But in convergence, the more notaries you have, the better, because all of them would have to start acting appropriately uh, in order to compromise your communication. And if for some reason you decide, oh, I don't, I don't like you know, what one of these notaries is doing, you have perfect trust agility. You just remove the notary. Nothing changes. Nothing breaks. You know, there's no certificates to get reissued or re-signed of the internet. Court of the internet doesn't disappear. We don't have to issue browser patches, none of this stuff. Uh, and you might decide, well, I'm going to replace it with a different notary. Everything continues working fine. The other nice thing about this system is that the servers do nothing. We don't have to migrate the entire internet to a different thing like DNSSEC or, or whatever it is. The servers just continue to operate exactly as they, they want. They can continue to get certificates signed by CAs if they wish. It doesn't matter. But what this also means is that if we implement convergence in the four major browsers, we're done. That's the end of the CA system entirely. We don't have to migrate the internet to anything else. We make these four changes and ban that entire industry is out of business and good riddance. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, there's some other nice things, which are, uh, there's no such thing as a self-signed certificate warning anymore. If you're running convergence, certificates are all treated equally. Um, there's some problems with convergence right now. Uh, one is what's called the Citibank problem. Uh, so there's this weird thing where Citibank has like 100 different SSL certificates for their website. Uh, and so if you're using convergence in the network perspective mode, uh, it ends up looking like you're being attacked, right? Because all the notaries see different certificates than the client, uh, and so you can you know, get these problems. Uh, the good news is there's only a few, a few websites on the internet that do this. Uh, Citibank is in the vast, vast minority. And actually, I talked to some guy, I gave this talk once, and I, get, I talked to some guy from Citibank. Afterwards, he was like, I work for Citibank. That's fucked up, man. You know, like, we're going to fix that. You know? <laughs> and I was like, all right, do it. You know, like, so I don't think it's too much to ask for a few sites to change their practices on the internet. Um, the other problem right now is captive portals. Um, you know, there's this issue where, let's say at the airport or at a hotel or whatever, and people have these captive portals where first you have to like, type in your credit card number in order to get out on the internet. Well, ideally, you want your communication with the captive portal to be secure because you're going to type in your credit card number but you can't contact your notaries on the internet yet because it's a captive portal. Um, there's a simple solution to that, which is that they let DNS out, so we need to use DNS as a, as a transport uh, to the notaries in that instance. Um, and there's also some other interesting things we can do there. Uh, so Convergence is available right now. You can download and install it. You can run set up a Convergence notary if you'd like, or just install the add-on in your web browser. Uh, it's available at convergence.io. Um, even if you don't want to try Convergence, I think that um, the one thing that I really like to leave people with today is this question. If people are proposing a new authenticity for SSL, or a new authentic authenticity system for SSL or for any protocol, I think the, the really important question, the first thing you should ask is, who do I have to trust and for how long? Uh, if the answer is a prescribed set of people forever, proceed with caution. Uh, in the meantime, try convergence. Thank you.